Aloha, and welcome to the seventh annual Mother Tongue Film Festival. I'd like to start by acknowledging with great respect the Piscataway Nation and its people whose traditional lands the Smithsonian Institution is situated on. This year's festival theme is Ikawamamua Ikawamahope. In Native Hawaiian thought, we look to the richness of the past to inform how we go forward in the future. We'd like to welcome you to the director's panel today, where we'll be looking at Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander representation in film. Thank you for joining our conversation. I wanna say a big aloha and mahalo to my two special guests, uh, Hinale Moana Wongkalu and Conrad Lihilihi. I have two great storytellers, great producers, great actors, great writers with me. And today our conversation is freeform and we are going to talk about uh, the, we're gonna be talking about representation of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in film or the lack thereof representation in film. So I'm gonna start out the questions and with it going to Hina first, what does Ikawama Mua, Ikawama Hope mean to you and how does that translate into your work? Ikawama Mua, Ikawa Hope, in the time before and in the time ahead or vice versa in the time ahead as in the time before. It speaks to a duality of understanding where my Kanaka worldview, my lens of this lifetime, to know where I'm going, I have to know where I've come from. To know the journey ahead, I have to know what my parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents experienced before. And I would need to utilize this information, this knowledge to inform and guide me. So those things all come into play when I hear ikuwa mamua, ikuwa mahope. If, I'm, if I made the same mistakes that people before me made, then what was the purpose of knowing? What was the purpose of acknowledging one's history, one's past? What's the purpose of even trying to do anything good for the future if I could not harness the power of lessons that come handed down from the generations that have gone on before me. Oh, mahalo for that. Mahalo. Conrad, for you, like in, in your work that you do, how, how does that sort of looking to the past to inform you going forward, how does that, how does that play out in, in your work? Um, I mean, similar to what Kumuhina said, um, all of those things, but also for me, it, it, it informs my work in terms of it. Uh, a lot of the issues that have kind of plagued our communities in the past, I know I, that I want to put those type of issues into my work in terms of to create that dialogue and to create that awareness to tell those stories. So, uh, I mean, just and just knowing those things of the past, good and bad, you know, putting all, all of that in my work. So uh, it's not just another, you know, superficial Hawaii story. It's actual, you know, depth of what our people and our communities are going through. So I, in, in speaking to that, too, both of your films, both um, The Stones of... Kapaimahu and mainland, they're, they're showing different narratives sort of of marginalization that happen, um, whether it's here in Hawaii with Kapaimahu or with, um, with mainland where it's actually a story from outside of Hawaii, looking outside at the opportunities. So um, I don't know who wants to take it first, but who would like to elaborate on why it's important to show, sort of show those stories of of that aren't necessarily told. They're not the minority story that, that come out of Hawaii. Usually it's something else, something commercial, something that doesn't even represent the people that exist here oftentimes. It's uh, that concept of terra nullis where used as a background and a backdrop and then the people are devoid of it. So how do you think, um, I don't know who wants to take it first, but 
how do you think your films actually sort of speak to that? We are here. These are some of the struggles we're going through. And, and like, why, why do you think that that is important as filmmakers? Come here, you could, you could go first. Mahalo. In filmmaking, we're telling a story. And as a storyteller, we hope that there would be some impact that there would be some idealism benefit, not just perhaps idle entertainment with no purpose or no, um, no goal. Uh, there are moments and times and there are, you know, there are opportunities for just mindless, ha ha ha, ha silliness. But, you know, when we can capitalize through our storytelling, uh, opportunity to empower our people, uplift, the integrity and dignity of who we are and and how to teach others then i prefer to choose that path so for example in the hawaiian community when we say that we are not in a good place when we say that our people have been colonized when we say that we don't like a number of things a through z that go on in hawaii whether it be development whether it be um prostitution of culture, cultural appropriation, you name it. We have to be able to inspire change. We have to plant, physically plant a seed. And our people understand this growing up when our parents would tell us, I got to draw a picture for you, right? So that, that planting that seed is often akin to being I'm drawing a picture for you. This is what this looks like. I need you to gain this, you know, this understanding. And when people can turn on the light, see the picture, touch, smell, taste, experience the seed that has been planted and grown, then maybe they might just start to see the world differently. Maybe then they would be more empowered and more inclined towards some sort of larger societal change that's necessary to, to shift the paradigm and to shift the realities that either we don't like, don't accept, or don't want. And as storytellers, it's our job to try to, to achieve the greatest impact even when we don't have much. Oh, mahalo for that. How about, how about you, Conrad? Could you repeat the question just so that I could get it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, um, so, so, so I guess, you know, with your um, short film with Mainland, you were, sh you you're displaying the challenges that it, that actors of Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander um, heritages have in that sort of Hollywood setting. And, why why was it important to you to actually like show that it, specifically it, for my film that was something that when i first moved to la i was uh kind of 50 50 split i was acting and doing production both half and half and on the acting side just you and this was back in 2000 nine 2010 maybe late 2008 you could kind of see certain individuals in hollywood i, I wouldn't say hollywood in general but you could see a, a small trend of trying to be diverse or of what hollywood thought diversity was and so uh just you know being where being from Hawaii and looking how I look, you know, Hollywood has all its interpretations of where who I should be and how I should be cast and what what uh, accents I should have and and so just navigating uh, that and really being aware that oh they're not necessarily looking for real representation it's like this facade and trend of what we think diversity is you know uh and so it, it the 
that kind of led me to that film because I mean, it, it, when you watch the film, every single one of those auditions, you know, as weird as they are, though, those are based off of real auditions that has happened to me. And so it just kind of came uh, to a point where I remember having to talk with my cousin and just having this kind of aha moment of like, you know, if, if really, if, and this was back in 2009, like really, if not us telling the stories, then, then who? Cause we could complain, keep on complaining about, you know, Hollywood's never going to do it right. Or Hollywood's does it, you know, only wants to tell these type of stories, but which they are. But for me, it was like, you know, it was time for us to tell our own stories. And so I just made sure to put all those, you know, moving forward. I wanted to, you know, cover those themes and be that help, be that voice of, you know, of what, what's really going on. Thank you for that. that. Question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, totally. No, I think uh, you for that answer. Yeah. I think it, yeah. I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I can contribute something to what he just said. Yeah, totally. Yeah. If we don't like how Hollywood represents us for whatever reason, and let's just take it as if I, as a Hawaiian, don't like Hollywood's representation of me and my culture, then I'd have to really think about what political, um, what, what political framework are we living in? Hawaii is is an occupied country. Hawaii is is a land that is governed by the United States of America, whether I like it or not. And as such, at every turn, on the political level, on the economic level, on you know social influences that come through all the ranges of media, from radio to TV to you name it, and our people are so attuned and ingrained into the fabric of being American that to deny Hollywood's representation of it would actually be inconsistent with everybody's other actions. So for example, if you're someone who roots for your team, are you for the Broncos? Are you for the who, you know, these for the Steelers? Are you for something? And if you're someone who subscribes to everything coming from the continent and not being self-sustaining, and this list goes on, but yet you don't like Hollywood's representation. Hawaii does not have that level of representation. So it's either you accept that we as Kanaka don't have this kind of thing that people gravitate to as you know and, and clamor for, because our people consume it, right? Our people consume and digest all of these things and internalize it and reflect it in how they posture in life so it's very inconsistent to say oh we don't like hollywood's representation if we don't like hollywood's representation then all the way around across the board we have to consider the implications for how do we change that narrative and how do we shift the paradigm totally and and that that's going to lead me into the next question um it's been stated that the film industry in Hawaii is going to hit a billion dollars. And so the, I guess the question I have there, and I don't know if either of you can necessarily speak to the economic implications that go behind it, but more toward the, how do you see Hawaii shifting from a backdrop and its people not being included in the narratives that happened here to then shifting to being the main focus of what's happening here. I understand there's films that, that just can't happen. They might be about dinosaurs or about other stuff, but there's also quite a few films and quite a few TV shows that are filmed here on a regular basis that talk about representation, but don't necessarily have it. And so Without forcing the issue, how is it that we go about changing the problem that exists there? So, I don't know. Who wants to take that one? Conrad? <laughs> I mean, I think that speaks to a bigger problem that, you know, that we 
uh, of like e of education in the community because I think um, and not necessarily just go to college education, but education of uh, opportunity that is aware it, that is available to us. Because I feel in Hawaii, you know, I remember being pushed to military. My like my dad used to say to us when he, when we was growing up, you know, you better go to college or else you go and join the military. Dance for the tourists. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it, it was a very implanted in your mind, you know, this glass ceiling, this, this is what we do. And it, it, when it came to entertainment, I remember loving it when I was younger, but there was no roadmap. There was no example of anybody doing it. And so it was like this mental block of like, we don't do that. They do that. Whoever is the proverbial they, we are always in the audience unless we're dancing for tourists. Uh, and that this stage we can never reach that stage and they will always tell our stories. But I think in terms of to your question, how can how can we change this or how can we expect Hollywood to change? Honestly, I don't think Hollywood's going to change. I think the more stories and the more interest in the South Pacific stories are going to... I think the interest is, is increasing because of, you know, more films being told and more of our people being cast into A-list celebrity them, you know, the Jason Momoa's, the Rocks, like all. So visually we're out there, but in terms of Hollywood changing, I think that's that's has to be done from the inside out in terms of people like, you know, Kumuhina telling her stories and making films, people like myself, people like all the other Kanaka filmmakers doing it. Like we can't expect Hollywood to change. They're going to do what they do <laughs> you know which is make money and that has and that is that supersedes are we telling the story properly you know uh we i think for hollywood to change we and i i say this very lightly not that we have to become hollywood but i really feel that i i feel almost like a spy like i'm infiltrating <laughs> an industry that we're not necessarily meant to be a part of and uh you know use becoming a part of that to tell to then you know re guide or whatever word you want to use you know but just re reclaim our our uh stories you know from the inside out from the inside from inside the industry that and that's the only way i could think I, I i could see hollywood remotely remotely changing is if we are in hollywood making the changes hmm. i don't think hollywood will change on its own as much as you know times are changing and you know at the end of the day we like i said we have to tell our stories you know every somebody with the greatest of intentions still who's still not part of the community may not know the nuances of you know the history may they don't know the nuances of the story so while the intentions may be you know there you know the the being a part of the community is and and reclaiming our stories from the inside is is i think is important thank you for that do you have anything uh, to add, Hina, on not necessarily the, not the changing Hollywood side of it, more of the, how is it that <clears throat> we go forward without the access to some of the, the capital that exists and still be on the same, not still present things in the way that we could if we actually had access to 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 those types of um i guess pots of money i mean they exist here but they they oftentimes are not accessible to the filmmakers here and so what constantly ends up happening here in hawaii is oftentimes we end up um, focusing on documentaries and doing other shorts in order to tell stories where if we had access to actual um, capital to do these types of things, we might be able to, to um, 
elaborate on our storytelling, I guess. And so I, I guess just looking, looking at the entertainment industry here in Hawaii itself and how it's tiered, how do we change that being kept out of it in order to assert, assert, assert our voices, assert at least the native Hawaiian voice into that? My answer may not sit well with some in the audience, depending on who's ah, watching. No, that's why we're let me, here. Let me be very blunt, because I guess I do that really good. <laughs> um, personally, as much as I can have an appreciation and as much as I have an understanding of, again, the larger dominant political system that we are under and everything that comes with that. When my film, Kapai Mahu, was nominated for an Oscar award for best short film, best animated short, it went higher and higher and higher. And I think my colleagues, Dean and Joe, took, took that, um, you know, took our position as not having moved beyond top 10. We didn't mm -hmm. make it to the top five. I, took, I think they took it harder than I, I did. I wasn't even phased by it because Hawaii is my pico. Hawaii is my mainland, not Hollywood, not the continental U.S., not any of that. I don't really care about it. You know, if my perspective is if it went that way, great, mahalo. And if we had accolades, no matter where in the world they came from, mahalo. Thank you. But the measure of success and the measure of, of value, the measure of importance, the measure of relevance, the measure of all these things that was supposed to define the level of success that my work is going to have will not be determined, nor defined, nor driven by that as the goal. I, I don't have time for it. I don't want it. And... If somebody dangled a golden carrot in front of me and said, well, we'll give you $2 million to do this project, but it would compromise the integrity of my story by requiring me to have perhaps elements that are going to totally misconstrue and, you know, and be inappropriate for my story, I would refuse. And that's just me. I'm not going to be about that at all. Um, and again, my Hawaii, my Hawaii is my most important place. I, I look forward to a Hawaii where we can say, sustain ourselves. We can have friendly relationships with the rest of the world, but this is the Pico for my people, our people. And if we don't go higher than here, Aolipilikia, it's just like the Nahoku Hanohano. You know, some of our artists bless their hearts. But if they aspire to the Grammys, there's nothing bad about it. But if you aspire to the Grammys, but you didn't get it, you know, if you were more hurt about that than you were hurt about not participating in the Nahoku Hanohano, then that's where, like, for me, it's just not, it's not any reality for me. I'd rather have us associate in the Pacific with our with our fellow cousins of the Moana Nui, Samoa, Tonga, Tahiti. I'd rather have us have athletic games, sports, in and amongst the polis. I'd rather have us do film festivals celebrating, you know, that which connects us. I'd rather have us have um, our educational, you know, learning and strategies and all those kind of things be rooted in the Pacific, in the Moana rather than always towards the continent because at some turn or other, the more dominant U.S. American um, shade and umbrella will always be there. I would never expect that Hawaii should somehow dominate anything from that realm, nor try to, you know, capture these top awards. If we do, great. But I wouldn't expect it to, to again have such a dominant governance over, you know, that area. I, I'm not concerned with it. That's an excellent answer. Thank you.
Yeah. And it moves on to my other, uh, I guess, both a statement and a question. It's interesting how few Pacific Islanders there are actually in A-list films. But when they are there, they have a tendency of dominating. As Conrad was mentioning, we have a plethora of Pacific Islanders that dominate film that are there. And I guess um, my question is, and I don't know if this is a question to you folks or it's a bigger question. So we have the Dwayne Johnsons, we have the Jason Momoas, we have the Keanu Reeves, we have the Kelly Who's, we have the Jason Scott Lees, and they dominate when they're actually making movies. And they are the ones that are demanded to be at that level. What would it be like if there were more openings for actors locally here, not necessarily for Hollywood, but just the opportunity? As Conrad said, it, that doesn't that ceiling that exists here that being a creative in Hawaii doesn't really ring for at least the generations that came maybe before us, like you know my father's generation or Conrad's father's generation, where it was sort of like there's an expectation of servitude. So I guess as storytellers and as you know actors yourselves as Hawaii's entertainment scene evolves into its own thing here, what do you think it'll look like the opportunities for actors going forward? I don't know if that's an answerable one or if that's something more, more outside of the... You know, again, all of those actors, they aspire to something within the context and within the parameters of an outside, because I treat it as an outside. It, when we say the word haole, haole means foreigner. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, but if, you know, and we all have ethnicity that is non-Kanaka, majority of us now. But from the larger perspective of foreigner in this context, if we're aspiring to a haole environment where it wasn't designed by or for us, nor driven, um, you know, for anything that has any relevance to us, then um, you have to aspire in the manner that's going to take you to the top of something within that system if you're going to go for the top. And props to them and all power to them if they can achieve that. You know, if if it has to do with Hawaii and trying to lift up Hawaii and represent the homeland, that's a different situation altogether. You know, so again, I if if you cannot, anybody in the audience who watches this cannot wrap their thoughts around it. Remind you, Hawaii is my mainland. Hawaii is my motherland. Hawaii is my pico, and everything radiates out. And how we synthesize and process all the things that go on around us. The information that we take in. The things that we like. The things that we don't like. The things that we give importance to. The things that we don't bother too much with. Hawaii is my mainland. Hawaii is my mainland. Hawaii is my mainland. It is my pico. So that, that should help to, to realign, recalibrate, and reorient listeners and viewers of this time that we're sharing what exactly what exactly do we aspire to what exactly do we constitute as success what exactly will it be to help us either aspire and achieve something that potentially remakes us in a form that's foreign or keeps us consistent with kanaka hmm. Oh, mahalo for that. That's all. Yep. Um, Conrad, you want to answer? Or we should, we go <laughs> no, to no, the no, next one. No, uh, <laughs> no, I, no. I think no, and that's. I think that's a very like. I totally agree with that in terms of what are we aspiring for? Because I mean, to go 
to your question in terms of what does that mean for the actors, I think it on the most superficial level, it just means that more people are getting work, which is cool. I'm glad I'm all done. I'm down for, you know, people getting work. But I mean, at the same time, it's, you know, some of these projects are questionable that are being brought in. Um, and that that's a tough situation. But I mean, I mean, there's so many layers to it in terms. I mean, it, you could you could talk about you know the 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 government officials and the tax incentives that that could be better in Hawaii in terms of you know film and television or you know the opportunities uh, that could you know be better in in film and television in, in Hawaii or but uh, I mean I think just everything goes back to like what Kumuhina said is it is it you know for us is it for the people is it for our story i think those are the things it's not for like the accolades and the oscars and side side note i i'd say around the year if not the year that um it was like la la land and uh what was the other one that that whole controversy i was i got i had the fortunate opportunity to talk with a couple of Oscar voters. And they're like, you know, old Holly guys, what you expected, like guys in their 60s. And we, 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 I was throwing out some other films, you know, that was more minority driven, you know. Uh, it was, at the time I was, what was it? Um, the one with Idris Elba, Beast of No Nation. But th- how the way that they, these guys were so dismissive of like, oh, I didn't even watch that. That movie wasn't for me. That was a movie that wasn't for me. And I'm over there thinking, I remember thinking like, but your, your Oscar voters, shouldn't you like see everything that's nominated at least, you know, not just be like, oh yeah, that one's not for me. I'm not going to watch it. But what just kind of, and it, it didn't seem like anything overtly racist or anything, but it just like seemed like, okay, yeah, it's not for you, but it made me, talking further with them it 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 showed me like okay maybe if that movie's not for you then maybe the oscars isn't for us you know what i mean it was never mm-hmm. and then that was that just so happened to be the year you know oscar is so white and i remember looking at some of the stats or something what the i what what it was at the time it was like 90 percent of the oscar voters at the time over 90 percent of them were like old white guys, like white guys over 60 or something like that. It was something re- really ridiculous, but I'm sure it's changed a little since then. But but I say that to say just cut being from where we come from and ha- yeah, having that as the gauge, like the, we're going to win an Oscar. Yeah, that's that's really, you know, the, at the end of the day, it it will help your career, but it, it it's it shouldn't be the gauge. It, th- those award shows weren't necessarily made for for us, you know. But uh, and and it should always be, you know, the story. I I feel you know comes first, you know, the proper telling of the story. Oh, mahalo for that answer. Um, I I'm gonna drill down into some into something that might make our audience a little bit uncomfortable um but i'm i'm i feel like i'm in safe company here with you too so i i wanted to kind of talk about sort of the concept of either it, it's been called different things but either the presentation of brown face or poly face and um we we've seen it in the past here in hawaii we're seeing it currently with a we'll say an unnamed Disney show that exists um, here in Hawaii, but this idea of people that are not native Hawaiian or not Pacific Islander playing these parts. And, and it's still going on today um, in, in this um, more so politically correct world where people are trying harder, um, I think, but we seem to still see it in the representations of, of at least Native Hawaiians. I'm, I'm going to speak on Native Hawaiian be- behalf. We continually see people of non-Native Hawaiian ancestry 
playing the parts of Native Hawaiians. Um, that Disney show will go unnamed, but you can find it online. And the majority of the cast are definitely not Native Hawaiian playing the parts of Native Hawaiians. So I was wondering if, if you two had any um, insight into number one, your feelings on representation um, of culture by someone that is definitely not from the culture and not even from here oftentimes. And um, what are your thoughts on maybe how do we rectify that? <laughs> um, I don't know, Hina, you wanna take that one? Oh, oh you're mute, you're mute, Kumuhina. Sorry. I think we should consider the ramifications of what exactly does it mean to invoke the ethnic card? Does invoking the ethnic card and saying that someone is ethnically Hawaiian automatically preclude them to being someone of cultural fortitude, someone who can be it and all about it? So, for example, if we were to take any one of our Polynesian cousins from the homelands that that is their islands, Tonga, Samoa, Tuvalu, Tokelau, all of these spaces where they still hold on to greater elements of the language of their islands, the dialect of, of the Moana Nui in their region. And they still practice the very same common principles, values, and practices of all of our, what some refer to as Polynesia, uh, but our people in the Moana. Um, <clears throat> Does writing a part and saying, oh, they're Hawaiian, does that require them to be some sort of utopian, idealistic Hawaiian that's supposed to represent that? And, you know, I nowadays I don't think so. Uh, I think Hawaiians, um, native kind of, it, it, it makes it a loaded term. Native means that we're supposed to be native when many of us are highly colonized and not living any native life whatsoever. We're just by some sort of, we're along the lines of blood quantum that serves to divide our people, that the darker we are, the more Hawaiian we're supposed to be. You know, so on one hand, no, I, I would not want somebody to be written as a Hawaiian if you can't even try to hire a Hawaiian. But the, the more salient reality is is that we don't have we don't have our uh, like a whole uh, range of people to draw from that pool is very small in terms of is there someone of our ethnicity that can um, represent and say that they're an ethnic Hawaiian and as ethnic Hawaiians are they able to convey, what's supposed to make them Hawaiian and what exactly is that? So, for example, wow, wakamai no wau i kakako o lelo. Ina, ina paha kakako e malama kui keia ku kakama iliu ana maka o lelo ma kuahine o keia aina pea. E maupopo ana no kapo ea pauloa, maupopo ana ya kako, a i ko kako ho maupopo, ya kako iho, no ko kako no ana, pehea la. Do we... You know, are we able to tra translate this experience? Like, can we can we do that code switching? Can we move away from the English speaking environment and really move into the language that was supposed to define and and help to articulate our worldview, our philosophy? So, ethnically, I know many ethnic Hawaiians that do not behave in ways that I feel is Hawaiian. And I know many foreigners whom demonstrate and, and display behaviors and, and conduct that is far more appealing to me as someone, you know, when I see someone who, who demonstrates that kind of heart and that kind of giving and that kind of selflessness. So, Ethnically, I don't hold the same value anymore as I used to. And and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do you one better. I'm gonna talk about Hawaiians on the continent. I love our people wherever they are. 
you know, something that I just learned from Tuvalu was that they're exerting themselves as as a politically sovereign entity by virtue of their ethnicity, but grounded in the fact that they're connected to a language and culture so that even if they lose their land base, that they're still considered a nation wherever they are. Now, question is, if we Hawaiians were tried to do that and we tried to extend this nation of Hawaii, wherever Hawaiians may be, is there some sort of definitive kind of level that we can assess, you know, what what makes you Hawaiian? Do all of the ethnic Hawaiians that live on the continent know what makes them Hawaiian? Do they know the homeland? Do they know our language? Do they know our, our culture and customs? Or are we basing privilege and advantage and entitlement solely on blood and the potential color of a skin? You know? And... And is, is all the Hawaiians entitled to benefits from the homeland when our own Ho Hawaiians left in the homeland struggle? I, as someone of Chinese descent, my father is Chinese. Do I look to my the homeland of my uh, ancestors on my father's side to support me? Will they come to my aid when I need something? Will they fi help me financially? Are there programs and benefits to support me? No, you know, so I think that all the way around, you look at the world and being Hawaiian and what does that mean? And and again, no, I don't appreciate if somebody's cast as, as Hawaiian and you're not even Hawaiian, I think that's rude, <laughs> you know, but there's, there's much more to this discussion. It's a very nuanced and very complex thing that I've spent years thinking about. So that's why I put that out there anyway no that's great that's great how do you see that conrad how do how do you what what is your interpretation of that going forward because i don't see i guess i don't see that interpretation of of what hawaiian is here in hawaii stopping until i guess we stop it from happening you know and so i i'd like to get your take on it though um conrad i I really love Hina, Hina's take on it, and I, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Uh, I'd say, like, well, one, I in terms of what Kumuhina was talking about, I totally, as as I've gotten older, I've totally grown to agree with that uh, in terms of my evolution of what and who is Hawaiian. Because I, I totally know what you mean, Kumuhina, in terms of, like, I know Kanakas who are, who are totally distant from everything. <laughs> and I know non-Kanaka who come in and embrace everything genuinely. And so, you know, that that helped evolve my my perspective. But um even to where and this is kind of what uh not I I how should I say it? Not tears me up, but my film The Mainland even though it takes place on the continent and it, the, my film, The Mainland, if you watch it, it was meant to be a pilot. And so in what, what, uh, what I hoped to get into was that discussion and in terms of the main characters kind of evolving what the thought of what their mainland actually is, you know, the continent versus, you know, back home. Uh, and, but when it comes to your question and like the show that you're talking about, I would, I mean, honestly, I feel that's just another example of, I mean, Hollywood doing Hollywood things. That's like, that's, that's what it's going to do. And that, that, that show, I could see all the positive intentions, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, it just, I don't know, it just goes back to us being in the positions to tell our stories properly because I cut that show, I, I kind of dismissed it. I, you know, I watched a couple episodes and I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, I have friends who work on it, I'm not gonna say anything, but I'm glad people are working. But this, you know, this is obviously just another Hollywood thing, you know, Hollywood representation. But the thing that got me with that show in particular was. Um, I saw an interview with the creator where 
she just she you know she was born in Hawaii but moved away really young grew up in on the east coast and she was half white half korean and she just wanted to have a, make a show about her being half white half korean in Hawaii which i was like great let's write that show <laughs> but what got me was the need to change it the main character her main character her to kanaka because with that comes that got me because you make that change from oh it's just like i want to see a mixed family white and korean in hawaii you know and then you change it to a kanaka family in hawaii we all know that the layers of that you know just come pouring out especially when you're talking about i mean still not giving away the title of the film the, the show but a 16 year old doing what they're doing. You know what I mean? It's like, so there, there's just so much. And you, you talk about Kanaka who even go, have the opportunities to go to college, you know, like they're just, and the education system in Hawaii to even put this Kanaka character in that position to have a show. You know what I mean? It, there's just so many layers that now they have to blatantly ignore to make that this can't be Disney thing, you know? And that that avoidance uh, is what kind of got me in terms of that show. And, but again, and maybe this is just me being pessimistic or cyn cynical about it, but I, I, I just kind of write it off to, yeah, no, that's, you know, baby steps. That's Hollywood being Hollywood, you know, they're trying, but <laughs> at the end of the day, that's you know the creator is not from Hawaii, you know, the that the big adventure Netflix movie about that takes place that is taking place in Hawaii. You know the I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. But even that one, you know that you know that was as I guess as good as uh, the film could get with a writer and a director not from Hawaii. You know what I mean? So I mean they're trying, but I I, I don't I don't know. Uh, more recently, I've tried not to give my attention to it because <laughs> I know that it's just going to, it's going to, more is going to come out, you know, more is going to come down the pipeline and, you know, people are, fortunately, unfortunately, people love Hawaii and those, those films, those TV shows are going to come out, but we, we have to be a part of it and help recorrect the narrative, yeah. you know. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to end it on a positive note here. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, I, you know, it was, our, our panel was meant to be serious with serious questions. Hopefully that, you know, some people got some things out of, but um, I'm, I'm going to ask this question to both of you. I'm going to start with Hina. What is your favorite part about being a storyteller? Oh, oh you're muted. Hi. <laughs> My favorite part about being a storyteller is that I get to not only control the narrative, but I get to draw the picture. Mm. And as I mentioned earlier, when my parents or grandparents had to say, what, I got to draw a picture for you. But I get to draw the picture. And therefore, I get to establish the framework. So this is an analogy. If you take a house, what constitutes a house that's a that's meant to have a symbiotic relationship with this environment here in Hawaii. Notice the traditional design of the hale. Why did our ancestors make houses that looked the way they did? And I sat in one that was designed like that recently. It was made of traditional materials and it was a wonderful experience. It was so cool and yet it was sheltered and it was just a pleasure to be there. So, you know, there are some basic components to house building and, and what's going to keep a house up. But does my house that I aspire to have to look like, you know, a house that many of us would normally consider as part of that American dream? And don't get me wrong. Would I like a nice fancy house? Sure. Why not? But I shouldn't, I shouldn't try to downplay the value of the framework of the traditional house. If I had my way, 
And if I had land big enough, I'd have a Western style house and a traditional style house because there's different purposes that I would need each one for in my life, you know? And, and, and so everything from the roof line to the angles, to the foundation, to you name it. Right. So I answered your question with drawing a picture and that's the beauty of it. I get to draw the shape of my Hawaiian house. That's a beautiful awesome. answer. Thank you for that. That's, that's awesome. awesome. And, and, and Conrad, what is, what is that thing for you? Um, along with that, being able to control the narrative and draw my own house. Uh, I think storytelling is the most, if not the most powerful teaching tool. And um, so much could be packed in it in terms of perspective and history and um, insight. Uh, and I think like for me, it just allows me the opportunity to present all of those things to people in Hawaii and people outside of Hawaii, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, just changing perspectives, help, helping, helping put up that mirror, <laughs> you know, and hopefully helping our community heal and grow, you know, through stories. I, I like that opportunity. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I want to say a big mahalo to both of you and taking the time out of your day to share your thoughts with uh, our Mother Tongue Film Festival audience. And it's um, not only been a pleasure, but you two are some of my favorite creatives, not only in Hawaii, and I just love every time we get a chance to speak to one another. And I, I, I feel blessed and fortunate to know you two. And um, I just like to say thank you and stay safe and malama pono. And uh, yeah, until we uh, are all in person again, uh, I look forward to it. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo, Nui. Mahalo. Aloha. <laughs>